here we go. Hello, welcome to week four. Um, I'm gonna try something new tonight, so we'll see how it works. I have a major lecture to give right now, and then I'm gonna introduce the essay that you're gonna be doing, your very first essay. Um, the first thing I wanna do is talk about the quizzes. If you picked up the packets, and a few of you have, by now you should have answers to some major questions, right? So here are the questions. And if you're watching and you don't have the packet, I suggest you take notes because these questions will be on the final um, quiz test you take at the end of 16 weeks. One thing that I've had a conversation with students uh, in my front driveway a few times this week is that this class is a skill set class. I'm teaching you how to write for all of the other classes you're taking. So that means that you can't take in the information and flush it, right? I need you to hold on to the information and practice the information because we're building skills on top of skills. So everything you turn in should be typed MLA format. Let's define that. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, your name, my name, class name, date, without moving any other spaces, title, and then you're gonna tab one mark and start your opening line, your opening paragraph. Um, that's for everything. I don't really care about what font you use, but it needs to be consistent. It should be black, it should be 12 font. You should be working in Microsoft Word docs or doc. Okay, so here are the quiz questions. Um, the first goal is knowledge retention. What is the goal of the course? Critical thinking and knowledge retention. What should every piece of writing have? A title. I said this so many times on your potato paragraphs. Most of you, either wrote me the most horrid title possible, potato paragraph, which is disgusting, it makes me want to throw up, or paragraph number one, equally awful, or paragraph, it, or no title at all. And I don't understand it, right? Everything gets a title. This is your chance to introduce yourself to your writer, show your effort, show your interest. And just imagine if we bought a cake for our collective grandma, right? The frosting on it is an indication of our effort. We would never go, let's say grandma's name is Susie. We would never buy grandma Susie a birthday cake that says Merry Christmas Tom. Why? Because it's not her and it's not Christmas, it's grandma Susie's birthday. The title has to be appropriate to the season, appropriate to the task. It should be creative. We would never go and buy the most ugly birthday birthday cake possible. We would take our time. We want it pretty. We want the colors to match their favorite colors, whatever it is. The same thing is true with the title. I should meet you every single time you write an essay. And the first thing I see is a title, a creative title, a unique title, a sarcastic title, a title maybe is in code until the last line of the paragraph or paragraph uh, or essay but there should always be a title. And that title, it says something about you as a writer. What should every piece of writing have? The question is a title. Uh, and then I play some games. I say define effect and effect. So I gave you links to the same sounding words. If you picked up the word packet, you're gonna notice that right in the center of it is a gigantic list of same sounding words, 441 to be exact. It's giant. If you have this in front of you, you need to be honest about it. Take a highlighter and write some tricks. The trick to effect and affect, A-F-F-E-C-T comes before E, that's the action, and E-F-F-E-C-T is the consequence or the result. That's how I remember it, that's my trick. So when you have a trick, you don't need a definition because you never get it wrong. Um, you should know the difference between active and passive voice by now. That was on one of my lectures, definitely on one of the handouts. Um, you should know all of your comma rules. The zero rule, one and two equals no comma. You should be very good at identifying the patterns. Uh, comma to separate items in a series has always a comma before the and or the or. The rule to combine two complete sentences never just a comma and never just a conjunction. You have to either have period or comma conjunction, right? That's the only way to legally combine two full sentences. 
We talked about comma rules for introductory phrases, transitions, and dependent phrases. Remember that comma is how the reader knows that the sentence is starting, okay? And if you're having trouble with this, you either need to call me so we can have an over-the-phone conversation, or you need to go back and re-watch re the Bicycle and Baskets movies over and over and over again with your comma rules in front of you until you understand it. Uh, third, I gave you the resource at chompchomp.com. You should be using that resource. Really important to practice so that you can identify fragments, run-ons, and comma slices. Um, you should know how to introduce a quote. You should know how to insert detail or definition about a noun. And if you have the sentence document in front of you, there are multiple ways to do this. You, should, you need to nearly memorize it because I'm going to keep testing on this until I see 90% of you know it, okay? Now, it's, I've never done the lecture that I'm about to do. If you have your packets, this is called soap. And the very first thing I'm going to go over is uh, soap for clean and clear writing. Now, right next to this lecture is also the documents for download and print. So you don't necessarily have to have the packets, but you have to have the document in front of you with a highlighter, with pen and paper, so that you can take notes on what you're about to watch and what you're about to hear, okay? Uh, I've never given this lecture sitting down, so I'm not sure how that's gonna go because I have a bunch of nervous energy and I've never given this lecture to an empty room. Um, I put my board here because I need to write a lot of stuff tonight and I feel like it might be just better if I have it handy and then you can pause it and hopefully I write neat and clear and we'll see how that works, okay? So SOAP for clean and clear writing. This is about, it's an acronym, guys. So S-O-A-N-P, okay? And this acronym I came up with in the Marine Corps, we use lots of acronyms to remember uh, fancy or important information. And I picked soap because we're all familiar with it, right? Have you ever tried to do laundry without soap? Your clothes don't get clean. They smell, actually. And they probably smell worse after you wash them than, without, than before. You have to have soap. Dishes, soap. Hair, soap. Dog, soap. Right? I washed the dog today with soap because the dog smelled and we needed the soap. Now, there's two things about this. And you can just kind of say here, you know, in your mind as I do this, but the reason these two lectures are important and I'm combining them, usually this is a four hour lecture that you're about to get uh, because I do SOAP one day and I do the five principles of academic writing another day. Um, my transcription program only goes 40 minutes. So you may have a part one, part two, and part three, we'll see. Um, the thing about writing is that I see students with a whole host of problems. So let's go through the problems that I'm aiming to address right now in this singular lecture, okay? Do you ever have a hard time getting started? You stare at your computer screen and you're not sure, okay? Do you only write about things you enjoy or like? Willow, I'm talking to you. Do you only research or read things you don't like or you like? Um, do you have no problem getting started, but then you ramble and your essay's all over the place? Have you ever written an essay and when you read it and it's done, you think, oh my God, this is crap and you hit delete? Or perhaps you start the essay no problem and you have no idea how to end. You hit writer's block, whatever the heck that means. Um, maybe you read it afterward and it sounds like somebody different read and wrote each paragraph. Or if you're like me, have a busy life, I have to go make dinner and then I have to go catch this and then somebody gets hurt. And in the time that I write an essay, three days of life has happened and it's disjointed and there's no flow, whatever flow means. Uh, some of you procrastinate till the very last end and others of you write it right away and never look at it twice. Some of you think that you do your very best work in one shot late at night, tired and drunk. And some of you probably fuss over it. You're perfectionists and you go back and you just change things for no random reason other than it feels right or it sounds right. Until your comma rules, many of you put a comma wherever you took a breath. Don't do that anymore. No comma, no rule, no rule, no comma. Only put a comma when there's a rule. So all of these issues I'm gonna talk about and 
the biggest one in the conversation is this. Have you ever turned in an essay and you got a different grade than what you expected? Better or worse? Maybe you turned it in, you thought it was crap, and somehow you got an A because your teacher didn't read it. Or the opposite happens, and you turn it in, you thought it was fantastic, and you got a B or a C, and you're like, what the heck just happened? Okay, well, the format I'm teaching you has a guaranteed outcome, okay? I'm sitting on a couple of degrees, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a master's degree. I have really high stupid GPAs despite working and having so many damn kids. Um, and the reason that my grades were stellar is not because I'm brilliant, it's because I was taught a formula that is correct every single time. And all I do is plug my information into the template and it spits out kind of like a wash machine a finished ready product that saves me time it allows me to be busy it allows me to come back and and just like a puzzle right i have a jigsaw puzzle in my other room right now we're putting together the, the red pieces and the green pieces and the blue pieces that's how the essay template will work now one of the major issues with writing essays is that people just go from the prompt to the essay and they don't take time to think about what they're about to write. That's not supposed to happen. Everything we do should involve choices, conscious choices. If you don't start making choices, your life's going to happen and it's not going to be what you want it to be or what you thought it would be. You're going to be surprised at the outcome. Uh, how many times have you gone to Walmart and you see old people working there? You think when they were 20 and 30, they thought they were going to be 70 and 80 working at Walmart? Well, I'll tell you, I'm never going to work at Walmart at 70 or 80 because I'm making choices now that enable and ensure my future. I know it's going to happen in my future because I'm planning for it, right? Well, the same is true with an essay. Uh, before you go play a sport, you have to learn the rules and then you have to get the gear and then you have to get your body in shape and then you have to you know, pick a location and find a coach. And there's a lot of decision making going in to you figuring out what you're gonna play in terms of a sport. The same is true with an essay, okay? Don't just shit out an essay because it feels good or it sounds good or you don't care about it. Think about what you're about to say and try to add to a global conversation. Now, SOAP is where that comes in. And these are the four choices you must make before you write, okay? Soap is how it's done. I think I'm gonna turn off the lamp because I think I have a glare. We'll see if that's any better. Okay, so let's start with S, okay? S stands for self, okay? S-E-L-F, self. And the question is, which self is talking? That's what we have to figure out. One of the amazing things to me is when I ask students, what perspective did you write from? They look at me like it's a foreign question. A student, always, you're always writing from the perspective of a student? Or do you own some other selves in there? Maybe some self in there is interested. Now, the truth is, if you're not interested in a topic, you have not gone through the process, right? And so get out a piece of paper, random piece of paper, and as I do mine, you're gonna do yours, and you're gonna see what I'm talking about, okay? Self, this is the perspective from which we speak about a topic. And I have a lot of selves. If I'm honest, I can get up to probably 100. Now, here are some rules. They're not fictional, they're not made up, they're not imagined, these are real life experiences that I can tap into that make me an expert or give me something to say about a topic, okay? Self, so that's the first choice I need to make. And here are my list, okay? I'm a woman. If you're a man, right, man. And I'm gonna do all the gender ones just to kind of get them out of the way, right? So I'm a woman. Um, I'm a working woman. I'm a married woman. I've been an engaged woman. Uh, I've been an unemployed woman. I've been a homeless woman. I've been a soldier woman. I'm a mom. 
And this one gets complicated because I've been a mom of babies, I've been a mom of toddlers, of kids, of boys and girls, of teens, preteens, post teens, young adults. I've now been an adopted mom, a stepmom, a legal guardian. I've been a host mom, and I'm a school mom. I've been a working mom, a married mom, a divorced mom, an engaged mom, a dating mom. All of those voices have something new and different to say, okay? Now, I'm also a modern woman. Do you think that my perspective in 2020 is going to be different than somebody who was raised, let's say, pre-1920? Or I'm a modern woman. Do you think that my perspective and my opinions, my voice is going to be different? Uh, sorry, I'm a U.S. woman than somebody who was raised in the Philippines or China or India or in South America, right? These are different voices for being a woman. Mine is different than, than somebody who is raised in Afghanistan, okay? Uh, I happen to be a California woman. Now, this might sound trivial, but I've lived on the East Coast. I've been in the Bible Belt. And women in Arkansas, they don't all see things the way I see them, right? I'm a California girl. I was raised on an island, so I can claim islander, surfer, um, I was in the Marine Corps, I can claim active duty, wife of active duty, deployed, wartime deployed, disabled vet. That's five different voices there. I can claim that I was raised in the Bible uh, bubble, right? The first song that I ever heard was the scriptures in alphabetical order. I didn't learn my ABCs. It goes something like this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, or Odyssey begins. Next comes Ezra and Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song. You get the idea? There's 66 of them. I knew that growing up. I was a Bible scholar before I was five years old. Okay? Then I went kind of atheist, and now I'm, you know, have more of a herbalistic relationship with the Creator and my Mother Earth. I believe in the gods because I teach mythology. All of these different voices have a perspective. I've been a renter. I'm a homeowner. I've been a landowner, a business owner, a photographer, a videographer. I'm a driver. Um, I'm a commuter. Kind of different things. When I drive to the store, I have time. I say, hi, I stop at the stop sign. When I was commuting 70 miles a day, I was on the gas, on the brake, and honking and getting speeding tickets. I have been on motorcycle. I've been on the back of a motorcycle. I've been overseas. I've been a tourist. I'm a writer. I'm a thinker. I'm a cook. I'm a maid. Today I was laying tile. Right? So, so all of these different perspectives have a voice. And that matters a lot because when I see a topic, I have to choose who's talking. Okay? Now this is how this choice works in real time. What I'd like you to do is sit down and write an honest list of all of the selves you own, okay? Again, not accidentally and not fictionally. These are real life experiences, real life memories, real life um, voices that you possess based on life experience. Now let's just say that my topic, and I'll never do this to you, but let's say my topic is abortion, A-B-O-R-T-I-O-N, okay, abortion. That's my topic. So when I look at this topic, I have to decide which self is talking, okay? And here are the selves that I come up with. Uh, if I'm a wife, my husband probably has a say. If I'm a girlfriend, my husband definitely doesn't have a say because he's not a husband. Uh, I'm a U.S. citizen. That right now, Ginsburg died, so we're going to have to see what happens with the Supreme Court. You better vote because it matters. Um, right now, abortion is legal. I have the freedom of choice. But not every place in the world has this opportunity, right? Uh, I'm a modern woman. I know how they used to do abortion with coat hangers and throwing girls down flights of stairs. That's pretty frightening. Um, I was a soldier. That gives me the right to choose. Uh, I fought for your right to choose, right? I protected constitutional freedom. 
Uh, I was raised Bible, so I could definitely talk about the morality of it. I happen to be secular now, so I don't think the morality of it is anybody's business but your own. I happen to be a mother of daughters, and I think that parental notification is a thing. I'm not saying I should have to give my permission or consent, but I want to know if one of my girls gets an abortion so that if they have troubles or medical complications or more importantly, emotional complications, I can get them help. I happen to be a daughter and it is not my mom's business. No way, no how, if I get in trouble and I figure it out, not my mom's business. I happen to be an athlete Statistically, athletes use this word less than other people. I'm not quite sure why that is. I happen to be an educator. I think with enough education, maybe we could get rid of the word altogether. Um, I happen to be, what else? A movie fan. And my favorite movie is about this word. Um, so, and I'm going to put traveler because I've seen how other places in the world do this. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's thirteen selves against one topic. That's thirteen essays. The catch is to pick one. Okay, and that's how this works. When I was first starting and learning how to do this, I had a printed list of selves. Every time I did something new, tasted something new, went somewhere new, I added to my list, right? And when I got an essay topic, I would compare my list of selves to the topic so that I always had something honest to say and I could find a door of connection. I'm not saying interest, I'm saying connection. I don't care if you like it, but what I do care is that you have an honest connection to the topic. And when I figure all of this out, then I have my essay. Now, the second part to this um, quest, if you will, is to only stick to that self. Nobody is saying that you have to put all of these voices into an essay, okay? And actually, that's bad writing. It's jumbled mess. Don't do that. You do not want to put all of your voices into an essay. And most often, and that's the case of writer's block, is because you've got so much going on up here and you have no idea what to say because you haven't made the choice of which self is talking. The next video is going to be on the next uh, letter, and that is opinion in soap.